Okay, good day. So today what we're going to be getting into is our combustion chambers in our oil heat uh, appliances. So really, <clears throat> the thing that we need to understand in regards to our combustion chambers is that we got to have some place for our flame to go and contain that flame so that it's not burning down houses and all sorts of stuff. So the combustion chamber is a, a vital part of, you know, the combustion process. Uh, the com chambers have to be made of the correct material for the specific types of uh, firing rates that a burner is going to uh, be using. Uh, we have to make sure that the combustion chamber is also sized correctly for uh, the nozzle, the spray pattern, angle, uh, the gallons per minute that we are going to be uh, using for, the, uh, for that appliance. Because if we don't check into a lot of these things, we're going to have problems. We're going to have problems with the efficiency. We're going to have problems with the combustion. You're going to have units that are going to soot up. They're going to rumble. They're going to do all sorts of crap if uh, the combustion chamber isn't uh, the correct size, uh, if it's not uh, intact like we want it to be. Okay, so combustion chambers have really a profound effect on the first three of the four rules for good heating oil combustion. You know, obviously the oil has to be completely atomized and vaporized in order for it to burn correctly. The oil has to be uh, burned in complete suspension, and I'm going to cover that in a little bit. I wonder why, why that has to happen. The mixture of air and oil vapors will burn best in the presence of a hot refractory or a hot combustion chamber. So in other words, the combustion chamber has to be at a certain temperature in order for us to really burn it completely. Uh, and a minimum amount of air must be supplied for complete inefficient combustion. Well, where do we get that from? Well, we get that from the burner, right? So we got to make sure that we do a combustion efficiency test and make the correct adjustments to our burner so that we can achieve that efficient combustion. So in other words, to burn the oil in suspension, like I just previously mentioned, it means that the fire must never touch any surface, especially a cold one. If we do that, and that fire reaches a cold surface, it's going to reduce the temperature of the gas. It's going to reduce the temperature of the flame, right? So when that happens, that vaporized carbon in the fuel is going to turn to smoke and soot. And it's not going to burn right. You're going to have a sooty flame. You're going to have smoke coming out the chimney. You're going to be going back and you're going to be cleaning that furnace or boiler more than, you know, the recommended amount of times. So we want to try to make sure that the flame, when it's in our combustion chamber, isn't hitting anything. It just It's sitting in the chamber and it's not impinging on the side of the furnace or or any areas. So for the combustion to be self-sustaining, obviously the heat produced by the flame must be sufficient to ignite the fresh mixture of oil, vapor, and air coming into the combustion zone from the burner. Okay, the hotter the area around the burning zone, the easier and more completely the oil will burn. If the chamber is too small, or the wrong shape of the burner air pattern, or the nozzle is too close to the floor, there will be flame impingement, which is going to cause smoke and soot. Okay, so when we're dealing with non-flame retention burners, our older style stuff, an oversized chamber refractory will not reflect enough heat back into the burning zone to burn that carbon. Okay, so therefore, you're going to have smoke. Okay, and when we have smoke, we have soot. So it is obviously our job as a mechanic HVAC guy 
to diagnose an incorrectly built chamber as well as to build and design a correct one. So chamber material, there's a lot of them out there. Okay? There's at least five that are commonly used for our combustion chambers. Okay, so the chambers, they should heat up quickly. They should reflect as much heat back into the burning zone as possible and cool off quickly when the burner shuts down. So out of those five, the first one that we're going to discuss is the insulating fire brick. Now this type of stuff, it's porous in nature, it's light for this type of material, and it makes highly resistant to the penetration of heat. Okay, the side of the brick facing the fire glows uh, red in about 15 seconds, while the rear surface remains relatively cool. Okay, for fires up to three gallons per hour, you can use 2,000 degree fire brick. It will take up to about 3,000 degrees, but it will not necessarily work very well. It's going to kind of break down uh, over time simply due to the fact of that violent uh, rumble and that high firing rate. Common fire brick, or better known as hard brick, uh, this weighs more than your insulating brick and can absorb much more heat before it begins reflecting any back to the uh, burning zone. It, can, it is not used uh, for residential purposes, but is used in a lot of your commercial units because it stands up better to the uh, high shocking load of high firing rates. Uh, the bricks come in standard sizes of nine inches long by four and a half high or in two and a half deep. Uh, it is also made in runners or in precast chambers. Your metal fire uh, chambers. Metal fire chambers are used primarily in your factory built quote unquote packaged units because they can be shipped in place without damage or breakage and do not require any sort of bracing. Uh, metal chambers are much better than your common fire brick. However, they are sensitive to improper nozzle selection and over firing. These types of chambers are very, very temperamental to the uh, firing rates that we are dealing with uh, in our chambers. So if you, we do have metal fire chambers in our burners or in our boilers and furnaces, we have to make sure that our firing rate, our nozzle sizes are to the factory specifications for that unit. Otherwise, you're going to basically uh, put a hole right through that type of uh, chamber. If we have a nozzle that is too high or a lopsided fire can distort or even burn a hole through them, really. Uh, they really don't hold up very well to those types of uh, situations. Uh, direct flame impingement on the chamber has to be avoided at all costs. The metal chamber must have free flowing air behind them to keep them from burning through. So obviously we got to have air that's going to take that heat away from the uh, from that heat exchanger or from that chamber. If not, it's going to just deteriorate. Okay. Do not put any kind of insulating material, uh, including soot, around the chamber. The higher flame temperatures of flame retention burners is tough on all your metal chambers. It is usually a good idea to replace a burned out metal chamber with a precast ceramic one. Your ceramic chambers, these are excellent uh, types of chambers to use. It reflects heat quickly while absorbing very little and it is easy to install. If the old chamber is still in good condition, you may use ceramic blanket material to line the old chamber, but if you're going to do that, you have to make sure that you seal any leaks in the old chamber first. And if the old chamber is deteriorated, wrap the material with stainless steel binders. And if the old chamber has was too small or the wrong shape, obviously, to begin with, <laughs> lining it isn't going to help at all. You got to simply just take it out. You got to put the correct size in. 
ceramic chambers become brittle after firing. So do not ever touch a ceramic chamber after it has been fired with a vacuum hose to clean off any soot or any crap that's on it because you're just going to do more damage than good. Do not touch it with any with a flame mirror after it has been used. You're just going to destroy it. Okay, the material is intended for firing rates below three gallons per hour and will withstand temperatures up to about 2300 degrees. Okay, it can be purchased by the foot or is available in your pre-shaped sizes. The material gives quieter operation, less smoke and fuel savings. Your molded chambers, a lot of our manufacturers today are installing their own molded chambers in their units. Uh, they are usually made of semi-insulated refractory material and usually when these things go you're basically replacing the entire furnace anyway because it costs more in labor to try to take the chamber out put a new one in than versus just taking the old furnace out and putting a new one in. All right, so chamber sizes. The best shape that we can use for oil is your round or your oval type of chambers. And that's basically because of the way the air is moving around the chamber. It can sweep back more smoothly and you can create a better burn. So if a square or rectangular chamber is being used, you can actually have what's called eddy currents develop in the corners, requiring more air to burn that oil uh, completely. Okay, the correct height of your chamber is really the most important part when it comes to your chamber sizes. All combustion should take place in the chamber. There should be little, if any, flame above the chamber. And the top of the chamber should be about as far above the nozzle as the floor is below it. The gallons per hour firing rate determines the size of your chamber. If you have a firing rate of anywhere between 0.75 to 3 gallons per hour, that's going to require about 80 square inches of chamber floor space per gallon of fuel. If you're firing anything higher than that, for example, about 3.5 to 5 gallons per hour, that's going to require about 90 square inches. Okay, And if you're gyring over 5.5 gallons per hour, you're going to need 100 square inches per gallon. So what we use to figure out what type of chamber and sizes that we need, we actually have charts that we can honestly use. So if we are using a, a burner and we're dealing with a nozzle, say about 0.75 gallons per hour, we need at least 60 square inches of combustion chamber area that we're going to need. If we're going to deal with a square chamber, we need at least an 8 by 8. Okay? Our round uh, combustion chambers, we need at least 9, a 9 inch diameter chamber for those types of stuff. So if we're dealing with and we're taking measurements from our nozzle to the floor, we can honestly take some, we know what type of size that we need. So for this one here, height from the nozzle to floor in our inches, if it's a conventional burner with our length and height, we need five by five. Okay? So we have charts that we can use to figure out uh, what type of burner that we're dealing with. So a conventional burner, length by width, okay, five. Conventional burner, single nozzle, all right, kind of goes with the same. Sunflower flame burner, single nozzle, five. Okay, if we're dealing with a, let's see, uh, let's go with, a, we're dealing with a one and a half gallon per hour nozzle. Okay, our chamber here, we need a uh, 120 square inch area or an 11 by 11 square inch combustion chamber or a 12 by 3 eighths. Okay, so there's all different types of charts that we can use to figure out the size of the chamber that is preferred for a particular uh, 
gallon per hour nozzle. Obviously, this chart here is for your 80 square inch per gallon nozzles. Where do we find these types of information? It can be in a mechanical code book. It can be with the manufacturer specifications. We just hopefully have to have the information there to kind of help guide us figure out what size nozzle or what size combustion chamber that we need. Okay, recommended minimum inside dimensions of your refractory type combustion chambers. Well, for that, we have to, again, take a couple of measurements. Okay, length, width, and our, um, our C dimension, as what we like to call it. Okay, so when we're taking these types of readings, first off, we have to know the size nozzle that we are dealing with. Okay, so if we're dealing with a 0.5 gallon per hour nozzle, okay, we need to have at least a minimum for our length of our entire type of uh, combustion chamber, we need at least eight, eight inches, okay? Our width from top to bottom, we need at least seven, okay? And our dimension, which is taking from the floor to our nozzle or from the center of the flame, basically, we need at least four inches across there, okay? So you gotta kinda take some measurements. You gotta have a ruler to do this, okay? Suggested height for that particular type, eight inches. Okay, so from eight inches off of the floor, minimum diameter obviously is eight. Okay, when we're taking our burners and we are inserting them into our uh, combustion chambers, the burner head should be a quarter inch back from the inside wall of the combustion chamber, okay? Under no circumstances should the burner head extend into the combustion chamber, and if the chamber opening is in excess of four and three-eighths inches, additional setback may be required. Obviously, when we are setting our burners into our, our units, we wanna follow your manufacturer's recommendations uh, and set them to the correct uh, dimensions as we need. So obviously when we're doing this, you really should always have at least a quarter inch back from the uh, side, from the inside of your combustion chamber. 